Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Gus Katsiapis, and I'm a principal engineer in TFX. Hi, everyone. I'm Anusha. I'm a product manager in TFX. Today, we'll talk to you about our end-to-end -end ML platform, TensorFlow Extended, otherwise known as TFX, on behalf of the TFX team. So the discipline of software engineering has evolved over the last five plus decades to a good level of maturity. Um, if you think about it, this is both a blessing and a necessity because uh, our lives usually depend on it. Um, at the same time, the popularity of ML has been increasing rapidly over the last two plus decades. And over the last decade or so, it's been used very much, very actively, both in experimentation and production settings. It is no longer uncommon for ML to power widely used applications that we, uh, we use every day. Um, so much like was the case for software engineering, the, the wide use of ML technology necessitates the evolution of the discipline from ML coding to ML engineering. As most of you know, to do ML in production, you need a lot more than just a trainer. Uh, for example, the trainer code in an ML production system is usually 5 to 10% of the majority of the entirety of the code. And similarly, the amount of time that engineers spend on the trainer is often dwarfed by the amount of time engineers spend in preparing the data, ensuring it's of good quality, ensuring it's unbiased, etc. At the same time, research eventually makes its way into production, and ideally, one wouldn't need to change stacks uh, in order to evolve an idea and put it into a product. So I think what is needed here is uh, flexibility and robustness and a consistent system that allows you to apply an ML in a product. And remember that the ML code itself is a tiny piece of the entire puzzle. Now, here is a concrete example of the difference between ML coding and ML engineering. As you can see in this use case, it took about three weeks to build a model. It's about a year. It's still not deployed in production. Similar stories used to be common at Google as well but we made things noticeably easier over the past decade by building ML platforms like TFX. Now, ML platforms in Google is not a new thing. We've been building Google-scale machine learning platforms for quite a while now. Sybil existed as a precursor to TFX. It started about 12 years ago. A lot of the design, code, and best practices that we gain through Sybil have been incorporated into the design of TFX. Now, while TFX shares several core principles with Sybil, it also augments it under several important dimensions. This made TFX to be the most widely used end-to-end -end ML platform at Alphabet while being available on-premises and on GCP. The vision of TFX is to provide an end-to-end -end ML platform for everyone. By providing this ML platform, our goal is to ensure that we can proliferate the use of ML engineering, thus improving ML-powered applications. But let's discuss on what it means to be an ML platform and what are the various parts that are required to help us realize this vision. So today we're going to tell you a little bit more about how we enabled global-scale ML engineering at Google, from best practices and libraries all the way to a full-fledged end-to-end ML platform. So let's start from the beginning. Machine learning is hard. Doing it well is harder, and applying, doing it in production and powering applications is actually even harder. We want to uh, help others avoid the many, many pitfalls that we have encountered in the past. And to that end, we actually publish papers, blog posts, and other material that capture a lot of our learnings and our best practices. So um, here are but a few examples of our publications. They capture collective lessons learned more than a decade of Applied ML at Google. And several of them, like the rules of machine learning, are quite comprehensive. Uh, we won't have time to go into them today as part of this talk, obviously, but we encourage you to take a look when you get a chance. While best practices are great, communication of best practices alone would not be sufficient. This does not scale because it does not get applied in code. So we want to capture our learnings and best practices in code. We want to enable our users to reuse these best practices and at the same time give them the ability to pick and choose. To that extent, we offer standard and data parallel libraries. Now, here are a few examples of libraries that we offer for different phases of machine learning to our developers. As you can see, we offer libraries for almost every step of your ML workflow, starting from data validation to feature transformations to analyzing the quality of a model all the way 
still serving that in production. We also make transfer learning easy by providing TensorFlow Hub. ML Metadata is a library for recording and retrieving metadata for ML workflows. Now, the best part about these libraries is that they are highly modular, which makes it easy to plug into your existing ML infrastructure. We have found that libraries are not enough within Alphabet, and we expect the same elsewhere. Uh, not all users need or want the full flexibility. Uh, some of them might actually be confused by it, and many users prefer out-of-the-box solutions. Uh, so what we do is manage the release of our libraries. We ensure they're nicely packaged and optimized. But importantly, we also offer higher level APIs. And those come frequently in the form of binaries or components, or uh, containers, sorry. Yeah. Libraries and binaries provide a lot of flexibility to our users. But this is not sufficient for ML workflows. ML workflows typically involve inspecting and manipulating several types of artifacts. So we provide components which interact with well-defined and strongly typed artifact APIs. The components also understand the context and environment in which they operate in and can be interconnected with one another. We also provide UI components for visualization of the said artifacts. That brings us to a new functionality we are launching in TensorFlow World. You can run any TFX component in a notebook. As you can see here, you can run TFX components cell by cell. This example showcases a couple of components. The first one is example gen. Example gen ingests data into a TFX pipeline, and this is typically the first component that you use. The second one is statistics gen, which computes statistics for visualization and example validation. So when you run a component like statistics gen in notebook, you can visualize something like this, which showcases stats on your data, and it helps you detect anomalies. The benefit of running TFX components in a notebook is twofold. First, it makes it easy for users to onboard onto TFX. It helps you understand the various components of TFX and how you connect them and the order in which you can go. It also helps with debugging the various steps of your ML workflow as you go through the notebook. Through our experience, uh, though, we've learned that components aren't actually sufficient for uh, production ML. Manually orchestrating components can become cumbersome and, importantly, error-prone. Uh, and also understanding the lineage of all the artifacts that are produced by those components, that are produced or consumed by those components, is often fundamental, both from a debugging perspective, and, but many times from a compliance perspective as well. As such, we offer ways of creating task-driven pipelines of components. We, we allow you to stitch to get, uh, components together in a task-driven fashion. But we have also found that data scale and advanced use cases also necessitate this platform, this pipeline, to actually be reactive to the environment, right? So we found that over time we need more something like data-driven components. Now, the interesting part here is that the components we offer are the same components that can operate both in a task-driven task mode and in a data-driven mode, thereby enabling more flexibility. And the most important part is that the, art, the artifact lineage is tracked throughout this ML pipeline, whether it's task or data-driven, which helps experimentation, debugging, and compliance. So here's putting it all together. Here is kind of a canonical production end-to-end -end ML uh, pipeline. It starts with example generation, statistic generation to ensure the data is of good quality, proceeds with transformations to augment the uh, data in ways that make it easier to fit the model, Training the model, after we train the model, we ensure that it's of good quality, and only after we're sure it's, it meets the quality bar that we're comfortable with do we actually push to one of the serving systems of choice, whether that's a server or a mobile application TF Lite, via TF Lite. Note that the pipeline topology here is fully customizable, right? So you can actually move things around as you please. And importantly, if one of the out-of-the-box out components we offer doesn't work for you, you can create a custom component with custom business logic. And all of this is under a single uh, ML pipeline. Now, uh, what, does it need, what does it mean to be an end-to-end -end ML platform, right? So I think there are some key properties to it. And one is seamless integration, right? We want to make sure that all the components within, those pipeline actually, uh, within the pipeline actually seamlessly interoperate with each other. And we have actually found that within Google, the value added for our users gets larger as they move higher up the stack, you know, as they move higher from libraries, going further up to components and further up into, library, into the pipeline itself. This is because uh, uh, operating at a higher level of the abstraction allows us to give better robustness and supportability. 
Another important aspect of an ML platform is its interoperability with the environment it operates in. So each of those platforms might be employed in different environments, you know, some on-premises, some on GCP, et cetera, and we need to make sure that we interact with the ecosystem that you operate in. So PFX actually works with other parts of the, fundamental parts of the ML ecosystem, like Kubeflow pipelines, Apache Beam, uh, Apache Spark, Flink, Airflow, et cetera. This interoperability also gives us something else that's very important here, the flexibility, right? So we allow customization of components and extension points within the ML platform that allows you to, uh, if something doesn't work out of the box for you, it allows you to customize it to your business needs. TFX is by no means a perfect platform, but we strive to collect feedback and improve it. So please give it to us. Internally, TFX platform powers several alphabet companies. Within Google, it powers several of our most important products that you're probably familiar with. Also, TFX powers by integrates with cloud AI platform, ML engine and data flow products, and thus helping you realize your ML needs robustly on GCP. TFX also powers several of cloud auto ML solutions that automate and simplify ML for you. So check them out. To the external world, TFX is available as an end-to-end -end solution. Our friends at Twitter, who spoke at the keynote yesterday, talked about they have already published like a fascinating blog post on how they are ranking tweets on their home timeline using TensorFlow. They are using TensorFlow model analysis and TensorFlow Hub for sharing word embeddings. They evaluated several other technologies and frameworks and decided to go ahead with TensorFlow ecosystem for their production requirements. Similar to Twitter, we also have several other partners who are using TFX. I hope you will join us right after this talk to hear from Spotify on how they are using TFX for their production workflow needs. We also have another detailed talk later today called TFX, Production ML Pipelines with TensorFlow. So we have two great talks, one by Spotify, the other one detailed talk on TFX. If you're interested in learning more, check these two talks. Visit our webpage, tensorflow.org slash TFX to get started. Thank you. Very excited to be here. So my name is Tony Jabara. Um, uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about Spotify, where I work today, and how we've basically taken personalization and moved it onto TensorFlow. I'm the VP of engineering and also the head of machine learning. And I'm going to describe our experience moving onto TensorFlow and to the Google Cloud platform and Kubeflow, which has been really an amazing experience for us and really has opened up a whole new world of possibilities. Um, so just a quick note, as Ben was saying, before I started at Spotify, I was at Netflix. And just like today, I'm going to talk about Spotify's homepage. Also at Netflix, I was working on personalization algorithms and the home screen of Netflix as well. So you may be thinking, oh, that sounds like a similar job. They both have you know, entertainment and streaming and home screens and personalization. Um, but there are fundamental differences. And I learned about those fundamental differences differences recently. Um, I joined a couple of months ago. But the biggest fundamental difference to me is it's a difference in volume and scale. And I'll show you what I mean in just a second. So if you look at movies versus music, or TV shows versus podcasts, um, you'll see that there's a very different magnitude of scale. So on the movie side, there's about 158 million Netflix users. On the music side, there's about 230 million Spotify users. Um, that's uh, also a different scale. Also, the content really is a massively different scale problem. There's only about 5,000 movies and TV shows on the Netflix service. Whereas on Spotify, we've got about 50 million tracks and about half a million, almost, podcasts. So if you think about the amount of data and content you need to index, that's a huge scale difference. There's also content duration. Once you make a recommendation off the home screen on let's say Netflix, the user is going to consume that recommendation for 30 minutes for a TV show, maybe several seasons sometimes, two hours for a movie, only three and a half minutes of consumption per track, let's say, on Spotify. And they don't replay as often on, let's say, movies, but you'll replay songs very often. So it's really a very different world of speed and scale. And we're getting a lot more granular data about the users. Every three and a half minutes, they're changing tracks, listening to something else, engaging differently with the service, and they're touching 
50 million plus pieces of content. That's really a very granular data. And that's one of the reasons why we had to move to something like TensorFlow to really be able to scale and do something that's high speed and, in fact, real time. So this is our Spotify home. How many people here use Spotify? All right, so about half of you. I'm not trying to sell uh, Spotify on anyone. I'm just trying to say that many of you are familiar with this screen. This is the home page. So this is uh, basically driven by machine learning. And every month, hundreds of millions of users will see this home screen. And every day, tens of millions of users will see this home screen. And this is where you get to explore what we have to offer. It's a two-dimensional grid. Every image here is we call a card. And the cards are organized into rows we call shelves. And what we like to do is move these cards and shelves around from a massive library of possible choices and place the best ones for you at the top of your screen. And so when we open up Spotify, we have a user profile. The home algorithms will score all possible cards and all possible shelves and pack your screen with the best possible cards and shelf combination for you. And we're doing this in real time based off of your choices of music, your willingness to, recommend, uh, to accept the recommendation, how long you play different tracks, how long you listen to different podcasts. And we have dozens and dozens of features that are updating in real time. And every time you go back to the home page, it'll be refreshed with the ideal cards and shells for you. And so we like to say there isn't a Spotify homepage or a Spotify experience. Really, there's 230 million Spotify's, so one for each user. So how did we do this, and how did we do this in the past? Well, up until our migration to uh, GCP, TensorFlow, and, and Kubeflow, we wrote a lot of custom libraries and, and API in order to drive the machine learning algorithms behind this personalization effort. So the specific machine learning algorithm is a multi-arm bandit. Many of you have heard about that. It's trying to balance exploration and exploitation, trying to learn which cards and shelves are good for you and score them, but also trying out some new cards and shelves that might not know if they're kind of hidden gems for you or not. And we have to employ counterfactual training and log propensities and log some small amounts of randomization in order to train these systems in, in order to avoid large-scale A-B tests and large-scale randomization. Before we moved to TensorFlow, this was all done in custom, let's say, APIs and data libraries. And that had a lot of challenges. So we'd always have to go back and rewrite code. And if we wanted to compare different choices of the model underneath the multi-arm bandit, like logistic regression versus trees versus deep neural nets, that involved tons of custom code rewriting. And so that would, that would make the system really brittle, hard to innovate and iterate on. And then when you finally pick something you want to roll out, when you roll it out, you're also worried that it may fail because of all this custom stitching. Um, so then we moved over to the TensorFlow ecosystem, and we said, hey, let's move on to techniques like TensorFlow estimators and TensorFlow data validation to avoid having to do all this custom work. And so for TensorFlow estimator, what we can do is now build machine learning pipelines where we get to try a variety of models and train and evaluate them very quickly, some things like logistic regression, boosted trees, and deep models, and much, in a much faster kind of iterative uh, process. And then also migrating out to Kubeflow as well was super valuable because that helped us manage the workload and accelerate the pace of experimentations and rollout. And so this has been super fast for automatically retraining and scaling and speeding up our, our machine learning training algorithms. Another thing that we really rely on heavily is TensorFlow data validation, which is another part of the TFX offering. Um, one key thing we have to do is find bugs in our data pipelines and our machine learning pipelines while we're developing them and and evaluating them and rolling them out. For example, we want to catch data issues as quickly as possible. Um, and so one thing we can do with TFDV is quickly find out if there's some missing data or data inconsistencies in our pipelines. And we have this dashboard that quickly plots the distribution of any feature and the counts of different data sets and so on, and, and also kind of more granular things, like how much is uh, the user spending on the service, what are their preferences, and so on, looking at those distributions. We caught a bug like this one on the left, which basically was showing us that in our training data, the premier uh, tier uh, data samples were missing from our training pipelines. And then on evaluation, the free shuffle tier data set and samples were missing from our evaluation pipeline. So this is horrible from a machine learning perspective, but we caught it quickly. We're able to now trigger alarms and alerts and have dashboards and look at these distributions daily so the, the machine learning engineers don't have to worry about the data pipelines into their system. So now we have a Spotify paved path, which is a 
machine learning infrastructure based off of Google Cloud, Kubeflow, and TensorFlow, and it has achieved significant lifts off of baseline systems and popularity-based methods. Um, and now we're just scratching the surface. We want to do many more sophisticated machine learning types of explorations. And we really view this as an investment. It's an investment in machine learning engineers and their productivity. We don't want machine learning engineers to spend tons of time fixing custom infrastructure and catching kind of silly bugs and, and updating libraries and having to learn bespoke types of uh, platforms. Instead, we want to have them go on to a great kind of lingua franca platform like GCP, Kubeflow, and TensorFlow, and really think about machine learning and the user experience and building better entertainment for the world. And that's what we want to enable, not necessarily building custom, um, custom, let's say, machine learning infrastructure. And so if you're excited about working in a great platform that's got kind of a great future ahead of it, like TFX and Google Cloud and Kubeflow, but also working on really deep problems around entertainment and what makes people excited and engaged with a service and music and audio and podcasts, then you can get this best of both worlds. Um, we're hiring. Please look at these links and come work with us. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm one of the product managers on the TensorFlow team. And today, I'd like to share with you um, uh, something about TensorFlow Hub. So we've seen some amazing breakthroughs on what machine learning can uh, do over the past few years. And throughout this conference, you've heard a lot about the services and tools that have been built on top of them. Uh, machines are becoming capable of doing a myriad of, a myriad of amazing things, from vision to speech to natural language processing. And with TensorFlow, machine learning experts and data scientists are able to combine data and algorithms and computational power together to train machine learning models that are very proficient at a variety of tasks. But if your focus was to uh, solve business problems or build new applications, how can you quickly use machine learning in your solutions? Well, this is where TensorFlow Hub comes in. TensorFlow Hub is a repository of pre-trained, ready-to-use models to help you solve novel business problems. It has a comprehensive collection of models across the TensorFlow ecosystem, and you can find state-of-the-art research models here in TensorFlow Hub. Many of the models here are also, uh, uh, can be composed into new models and retrained using transfer learning. And, uh, a lot, and recently, we've added a lot of new models that you can deploy straight to production from cloud to the edge uh, through TensorFlow Lite or TensorFlow JS. And we're getting many contributions from the community as well. TensorFlow Hub's rich repository of models covers a wide range of machine learning problems. For example, in image-related tasks, we have an, a variety of models for object detection, image classification, uh, automatic image augmentation, uh, and uh, some new things like uh, image generation for cell transfers. In text-related tasks, we have some of the state-of-the-art models out there, like BERT and Albert and uh, universal sentence encoders. And you've heard uh, about some of uh, the things that machines can do with, uh, with BERT uh, just yesterday. Uh, these encoders can su uh, support a wide range of natural language understanding tasks, such as question and answering, text classification, or sentiment analysis. And there are also video-related models, too. So if you want to do gesture recognitions, uh, you can uh, use some of the models there, or even video generation. And we've recently actually just completely upgraded uh, our front-end interface so that it's a lot easier to use. So many of these models can be easily found or searched uh, uh, going to TensorFlow Hub. We've invested a lot of energy in making these models uh, in TensorFlow Hub easily reusable or composable into new models where you can actually bring your own data and through transfer learning improve the, the power of those models. With one line of code, you can bring these models right into TensorFlow 2 and using the uh, high-level Keras APIs or the low-level APIs, you can actually go and retrain these models. Um, and all of these um, models can also be deployed straight into machine learning pipelines like TFX, uh, as you've heard about uh, earlier today. Recently, we've added support for models that are ready to deploy. 
These pre-trained models have been prepared for a wide range of environments across the TensorFlow ecosystem. So uh, if you want to uh, work in a web or a node-based environment, you can deploy them into TensorFlow.js. Or if you are working with mobile embed devices, you can deploy, uh, employ some of these models through TensorFlow Lite. In Tensile Hub, you can also uh, discover ready-to-use models for coral edge uh, TPU devices, and we recently started adding these. These devices combine Tensile Lite models with um, some very, really efficient accelerators that allows companies to create products that can run inference right on the edge. And you can learn more about that at coral.ai. So here's an example of how you can use Tensile Hub uh, to do fast artistic style transfer that can work on an arbitrary uh, painting style for generative models. So let's say you had an image of a beautiful yellow uh, Labrador, and you wanted to see what that style would look like uh, in Kandinsky. Um, well, with one line of code, you can load uh, one of these uh, pre-trained style transfer models from the Magenta team at Google. And then you can just apply it to your content and style image, and you can get a new uh, stylized image. And you can learn more about uh, some simple tutorials like that uh, in this link below. Or let's say you wanted to uh, train a new trans uh, uh, text classifier, um, such as predicting whether a movie review uh, had a positive or negative uh, rating. Well, training a text embedding layer may take a lot of time uh, and, uh, and data in order to make that work well. But with Tensible Hub, uh, you can pull a number of pre-trained text models uh, with just one line of code. And then you can incorporate it into TensorFlow 2, and uh, using standard APIs like Keras, you can retrain it on your new data set, just like that. Um, we've also integrated uh, an interactive model visualizer in beta for some of the models. And this allows you to immediately preview what the model would do and run that, uh, that model within the web page or on a mobile uh, uh, app, uh, like a playground app. For example, here is a model from the Danish Mycological Society for identifying um, a wide range of fungi as part of the Svampa Atlas project. You can directly drag an image onto the site, and the model will run in real time and show you the results, uh, such as what uh, uh, mushrooms were, were in that image. And then you can click on it to go and get more information. Many of the Tensile Hub models uh, also have collab links, so you can play with these models in, uh, right, uh, in, uh, with the code right inside the browser and powered by the Google infrastructure with collab. In fact, uh, the Google Machine Learning uh, Fairness uh, team also has built some collab notebooks that can pull text embeddings and other embeddings uh, straight into uh, to their uh, platform so you can assess whether there are potential biases uh, for a, a standard set of tasks. And you can come by our demo booth if you want to learn more about that. Tensible Hub is also powered by the community. When we launched Tensible Hub last year, uh, we were uh, sharing some of the state-of-the-art models from DeepMind and Google. But now a wide range of publishers are beginning to share their models from a diverse uh, set of um, areas, such as Microsoft AI for Earth, the Met, or NVIDIA. And these models can be used for many different tasks, such as from studying wildlife populations uh, through these camera traps, or for automatic visual defect uh, detections uh, in industries. And crowdsourced by Google is also generating a wide range of uh, data through the open images extended data sets. And with that, we can get an even richer set of ready-to-use models uh, uh, across many different specific data sets. So with hundreds of uh, models that are pre-trained and ready to use, uh, you can use Tensorflow Hub to immediately begin uh, using machine learning to solve some business problems. Um, so I hope um, that you can uh, come by our uh, demo booth or go to tfhub.dev, and I'll see you there. Thank you. So the TensorFlow team with TF2 has solved a hard problem, which is to make it easy for you to easily express your ideas and debug them in TensorFlow. This is, this is a big step. But there are additional challenges in order to, for you to obtain the best results for your research or your product designs. And I'd like to talk about how NVIDIA is solving three of these challenges. The first is simple acceleration. The second is scaling to large clusters. And finally, 
providing code for every level, every step of the deep learning workflow. One of the um, ingredients of the recent success of deep learning has been the use of GPUs for um, providing the necessary raw compute horsepower. Um, this compute is, is like oxygen for new ideas and applications in the field of AI. So we designed and shipped tensor cores in our Volta and Turing GPUs in order to uh, provide an order of magnitude more performance capability, compute capability, than was previously available. And we built libraries such as QDNN to ensure that all the important math functions inside of TF can run on top of tensor cores. And we update these regularly as new algorithms are invented. We worked with Google to provide a simple API so you can, from your TensorFlow script, easily activate uh, these routines in these libraries and train with mixed precision on top of tensor cores and get speed ups for your training um, with examples here, for instance, 2x to 3x faster, which helps you iterate faster on your research and also maybe within a fixed budget of time, get better results. Once you have a trained model, you can, we provide a simple API inside of TensorFlow to activate TensorRT so you can get um, drastically faster latency for serving your predictions, which lets you deploy you know, perhaps more sophisticated models or pipelines than you would be able to otherwise. But you know, optimizing the performance of a single GPU is, is not enough. Um, and, and let me give you an example. So Google last year released a model called BERT. Um, as Jeff Dean explained yesterday, this model blew away the accuracy on a variety of language tasks compared to any approach or model previous to it. But on a single GPU, it takes months to train. Even on a server with eight GPUs, it takes more than a week. But if you can train with 32 servers or 256 GPUs, training can complete with TensorFlow in mere hours. However, training at these large scales introduces and poses uh, several new challenges at every level of the system. If you don't properly co-design the hardware and software and precisely tune them, then as you add more compute, you will not get a commensurate increase in performance. And you know, I think NVIDIA is actually ideally uniquely suited to solve some of these challenges because we're building hardware from the level of the GPU to servers to supercomputers, and we're working on challenges at every level on hardware design, software design, system design, and at the boundaries of these. Um, you know, the culmination of a bunch of our work on this is the DGX SuperPod. And to give you, you know, to put its capabilities sort of in visceral terms, um, a team at NVIDIA recently was able to, on the DGX SuperPod, as part of Project Megatron, train the largest language model ever, more than 8 billion parameters, 24 times larger than BERT. Another contribution that NVIDIA is making and what we're working on is providing reliable code that anyone from individuals to enterprises can build on top of. NVIDIA is doing the hard work of optimizing, documenting, qualifying, packaging, publishing, maintaining code for a variety of models and use cases um, for every step of the deep learning workflow from research to production. And we're curating this code and making it available to everyone, uh, both at ngc.nvidia.com, but also other places you know, where developers might frequent, such as GitHub and uh, TF Hub, which you just heard about as well. Um, so I hope that you know, in this short time, I was able to convey some of the problems that NVIDIA is working on, the challenges we're working on, and how we're making available to the TensorFlow community, uh, along with Google, simple APIs for acceleration, um, solving scaling challenges, putting out DGX superpods, building DGX superpods, and curating code that anyone can build on top of for the entire deep learning workflow. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. So the world is full of experts, right? Like pathologists who can diagnose diseases, uh, construction workers who know that if a certain tube is more than 40% obstructed, you have to turn that machine off like right now. Um, people who work in support and know how to like kind of triage tickets. 
And you know, one of the exciting things about kind of the past few years is that it's become increasingly easy for people who want to take something that they know how to do and teach it to a machine. I think the big dream is really that anybody could be able to go and do that. That's what I spent my time on in the past few years. I worked on the team that launched Cognitive Services, and I spent the past few years working on custom vision.ai. It's a tool for building image uh, classifiers and object detectors. Um, but you know, it really has never been easier to build machine learning models, right? Like the tooling is really good. We're all here at TensorFlow World. Uh, computational techniques have gotten faster. You know, transfer learning easier to use. You have access to compute in the cloud. Um, and then educational materials have like never been better, right? One of my hobbies is to go and like browse the fast.ai forums just to see what learners are building, and it's completely inspiring. That being said, it's actually still really hard to build a machine learning model. In particular, it's hard to build robust production-ready models. So I've worked with hundreds, actually at this point, thousands of customers uh, who are trying to automate some particular task, and a lot of these projects fail. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to build your first model, and sometimes it's actually kind of a trick, right? Like, you can get something astonishingly good in a couple of minutes. You get some data off the web, uh, you know, like models out fit, and like a few minutes later, I have a model that like does something, and it's kind of uncanny. Uh, but getting that to be robust enough to use kind of in a real environment, it's actually really tough. Um, so the first problem people run into is actually hard to transfer your knowledge to a machine. So like this might seem trite, right? But when people first train object detectors, actually a lot of people don't put bounding boxes around every single object. Like the model doesn't work, um, or they get stuck on like how kind of the kind of parsimoniousness. So for example, you one guy you know at Seattle, people like the Seahawks wanted to train a Seahawks class of, uh, a detector. You know, puts bounding boxes about, around a bunch of football players and discovers that he's actually really kind of built a football person detector as opposed to a Seahawks detector. Like, gets really upset when he kind of uploads another uh, information from another team because the model didn't have that semantic knowledge that the user had. And so, like, you know, this is stuff you can document away, right? Like, you can kind of learn this in your first hour or so. But it speaks to the unnaturalness of the way in which we train models today. Like, when you teach something to a computer, you're having to kind of give it data that represents in some way distribution. That's not how you and I would normally teach something. And it, it really kind of trips people up a lot. Uh, but sure, say you grok that, you figure it out, you figure out, all right, the problem is building a data set. That's really hard to do, too. Um, and so I want to walk through kind of one, one kind of hypothetical case. Uh, so we had a customer, and what they really wanted to do uh, was recognize when people had uploaded to their online photo store, like something that might be like personally identifiable information. So for example, if you'd uploaded a photo of a credit card or a photo of your passport, so to start this off, they scraped some web data, right? You just like go, you use kind of like a search, out, a search uh, API, and you get a bunch of images of credit cards off the web. You know, do evaluations, all right, looks like we're going to have maybe a 1% false positive rate. Well, that's not so good. I got a million user images I want to kind of run this on. Suddenly, I have 10,000 sort of potential false positives. So they kind of, but they build a model, let's see how it goes. And when they try it out on real user data, it turns out that the actual false positive rate, as you might expect, is much, much much higher. All right, so now the user has to take another round. So now let's add some negative classes, right? We want to be able to kind of make examples of other kinds of documents, sort of non-credit card things, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still OK, right? We're on day one or day two of the project. Like, this still feels good. You know, we're able to kind of make progress. It's a little more tedious. Second round. Uh, I think you guys kind of know where this is going. Like, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, still you have an un unacceptably high number of negative examples are coming up, way too many false positives. Uh, so now we kind of go into kind of stage three of the experience of trying to build kind of a usable model, uh, which is, all right, let's collect uh, some more data, from, or let's go kind of label some more data. It starts to get really expensive, right? Now something that I thought was going to take me a day in the first round, I'm on like, you know, day seven of like getting a bunch of labelers, trying to get like MTurk to work, um, and like labeling kind of very large amounts of data. Turns out, model still didn't work. Uh, so the good news was, at this point, somebody said, all right, well, let's try uh, one of these kind of like interpretability techniques. So they did saliency visualization. And it turns out, the problem was thumbs. Uh, so when you are using kind of, when people take photos, uh, like on their phone, of something like a document, uh, they're usually holding it, which is like not what you see in web scraped images, for example, but it's kind of what you tend to do. 
Uh, so it turned out that they had basically built a classifier that recognized, are you holding something, and is your thumb in the picture? Well, that was not the goal, but OK. Um, but this isn't just kind of a one-off problem. It happens all the time. Uh, so for example, there's that really famous Nature paper uh, from 2017 where they were doing uh, like dermatology images. And they kind of discover, all right, well, uh, having a ruler in an image of a mole is actually a very good signal uh, that that might be cancerous. So you might think we learned from that, except just a couple of weeks ago, I think Walker et al. published another paper uh, where they said having surgical markings uh, in an image, so having like a little kind of like marked up things around a mole, uh, also tended to kind of trip up the classifier because, not unsurprisingly, you know, people don't tend to kind of like the training data didn't have any marked up skin for people that didn't have kind of cancerous moles. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, particularly as people uh, sometimes on our team, sometimes look at that and say it's, it, it's user error, it's human error, right? They weren't building the right distribution of data. But that's like extremely hard to do, even for experts, and even harder to do for somebody who's just getting started. Because the reality is that like real world environments are incredibly complex. Like this is where projects die. Like out of domain problems, which most problems people want to actually do something kind of in a real world environment, whether it's a camera, a microphone, a website where kind of user inputs are unconstrained, are incredibly challenging to build good data for. Um, one of my kind of favorite examples had a customer who uh, had built a system, uh, kind of like camera, an IoT camera, and one day it hails. Uh, and it turns out that like it just hadn't hailed in this town before. Model fails. Uh, and like you can't expect people to have had data for hail. Uh, luckily, you know, they had a system of multiple sensors, they had other kinds of validation, a human in the loop, it all worked out. Um, but this sort of thing is really challenging to do. Like rare events, right? Like if I want to recognize explosions, like how much data am I going to have from explosions? Uh, or we had a customer who's doing hand tracking. Uh, turned out the model failed the first time somebody with a hand tattoo used it. There aren't that many people with hand tattoos, but you still want your model to work in that case. And so look, there's a lot of techniques for being able to do this better. Um, but I think it's like worth recognizing that it's actually really hard to build a model. That's an important problem. Once you build a model, you've got to figure out if it's going to work. A lot of the kind of great work here is happening in the fairness and bias literature, but there's kind of an overall impact for any customer or any person who's trying to build uh, a high quality model. One of the big problems is that aggregate statistics hide failure conditions. Uh, so you might have, you might get kind of this beautiful PR curve. Uh, even the slices that you have look really great. Uh, and then it turns out that you, know, you don't actually have a data set with all the features uh, kind of in your, your model. So let's say you're doing speech. You, know, you may not have actually created a data set that says, OK, well, you know, this is a woman. This is a woman with an accent or a child with an accent. All these kind of like sort of subclasses become extremely important. And it becomes very expensive and difficult to actually go and figure out kind of where your model is failing. And look, a lot of techniques for this, you know, sampling techniques, pairing kind of uninterpretable models with interpretive models, things that you can do. But it's super challenging for a beginner uh, to kind of figure out what their problems might be, and even for experts, right? Like you see like these problems come up in kind of real world systems all the time. Um, finally, when you have a model, uh, it can be tough to actually figure out what to do with it, right? Most of the programs that you use don't have probabilistic outputs in the real world. What does it mean for something to be 70% likely or to have seven or eight kind of chained models in a row you know, it might be more obvious for you, but for kind of an end user, it can actually be hard to figure out what actions you should take. Um, and so I think for me, look, nothing I've said today I think is particularly novel for the folks in this room. Like, you've gone through all of these challenges before. You've built a model. You've built a data set. You probably built it 18 times, finally gotten it to work. Um, but I had a boss who used to say that problems are inspiring. And for me, there isn't a problem that is more inspiring than figuring out how can we help anybody who wants to automate some problem be able to do so and be able to train a machine and have like a robust production ready model. And so I can't think of a more fun problem, and I can't think of a more fun problem to work on with everybody in this room. Thanks. So, welcome everyone. I'm Sarah. I am the engineering lead for TensorFlow Lite, and I'm really happy to be here talking to you about on device machine learning. And I'm Jared, tech lead on TensorFlow Lite. And I'm reasonably excited to share with you our progress and all the latest updates. So first of all, what is TensorFlow Lite? So TensorFlow Lite is our production-ready framework for deploying machine learning on mobile and embedded devices. It is cross-platform, so it can be used for deployment on Android, iOS, Linux-based systems, as well as several other platforms. So let's talk about the need for TensorFlow Lite and why we built an on-device machine learning solution. 
Simply put, there is now a huge demand for doing machine learning on the edge. And it is driven by a need for building user experiences which require low latency. Further factors are poor network connectivity and the need for user privacy preserving features. All of these are easier done when you're doing machine learning directly on the device, and that's why we released TensorFlow Lite late in 2017. And this shows our journey since then. We've made a ton of improvements across the board in terms of the ops that we support, performance, usability, tools which allow you to optimize your models, the number of languages we support in our API, as well as the number of platforms TensorFlow Lite runs on. TensorFlow Lite is now on, deployed on more than 3 billion devices globally. Many of Google's own largest apps are using it, as are apps from several other uh, external companies. So this is a sampling of apps which use TensorFlow Lite, Google Photos, Gboard, YouTube, Assistant, as well as leading companies like Hike, Uber, and more. So what is TensorFlow Lite being used for? So we find that our developers use it for popular use cases around text, image, and speech, but we are also seeing lots of emerging and new use cases come up in the areas of audio and content generation. So this was a quick introduction about TensorFlow Lite. In the rest of this talk, we are going to be focusing on sharing our latest updates and the highlights. For more details, please check out the TensorFlow Lite talk later in the day. So today, I'm really excited to announce a suite of tools which will make it really easy for developers to get started with TensorFlow Lite. First up, we're introducing a new support library. This makes it really easy to pre-process and transform your data to make it ready for inferencing with a machine learning model. So let's look at an example. These are the steps that a developer typically goes through to use a model in their app once they have converted it to the TensorFlow Lite model format. And let's say they're doing image classification. So then they will likely need to write code which looks something like this. As you can see, it is a lot of code for loading, transforming, and using the data. With the new support library, the previous wall of code that I showed can be reduced significantly to this. Just a single line of code is needed for each of loading, transforming, and using the resultant classifications. Next up, we are introducing model metadata. Now, model authors can provide a metadata spec when they are creating and converting models. And this makes it easier for users of the model to understand what the model does and to use it in production. Let's look at an example again. The metadata descriptor here provides additional information about what the model does, the expected format of the inputs, and what is the meaning of the outputs. Third, we've made our model repository much richer. We've added several new models across several different domains. All of them are pre-converted into the TensorFlow Lite model format, so you can download them and use them right away. Having a repository of ready-to-use models is great for getting started and trying them out. However, most of our developers will need to customize these models in some way, which is why we are releasing a set of APIs which you can use to use your own data to retrain these models and then use them in your app. We've heard from our developers that uh, we need to provide better and more tutorials and examples. So we're releasing today several full examples which show code not only how to use a model, but to how you would write an end-to-end -end app. And these examples have been written for several platforms, Android, iOS, Raspberry Pi, and even Edge TPUs. And lastly, I'm super happy to announce that we have just launched a brand new course on how to use TensorFlow Lite on Udacity. All of these are live right now. Please check them out and give us feedback. And this brings me to another announcement that I'm very excited about. So we have worked with the researchers at Google Brain to bring mobile BERT to developers through TensorFlow Lite. BERT is a method of pre-training language representations which gets really fantastic results on a wide variety of natural language processing tasks. Google itself uses BERT extensively to understand natural text on the web, but it is having a transformational impact broadly across the industry. 
So the model that we are releasing is up to 4.4 times faster than standard BERT, while being four times smaller with no loss in accuracy. The model is less than 100 megabytes in size, so it's usable even on lower end phones. It's available on our site, ready for use right now. We're really excited about the new use cases this model will unlock. And to show you all how cool this technology really is, we have a demo coming up of mobile BERT running live on a phone. I'll invite Jared to show you. Thanks, Sarah. So as we've heard, BERT can be used for a number of language-related tasks. But today, I want to demonstrate it for question answering. That is, given some body of text and a question about its content, BERT can find the answer to the question in the text. So let's take it for a spin. We have an app here which has a number of pre-selected Wikipedia snippets. And again, the model was not trained on any of the text in these snippets. So now I'm a space geek, so let's dig into the Apollo program. All right, let's start with an easy question. What did Kennedy want to achieve with the Apollo program? Landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. OK, but everybody knows that. Let's try a harder one. Which program came after Mercury, but before Apollo? Project Gemini. Not bad. Hmm. All right, Bert, you think you're so smart. Where are all the aliens? Moon. There it is. <laughs> Mystery solved. Now, all jokes aside, you may not have noticed that this phone is running in airplane mode. There's no connection to the server. So everything from speech recognition to the BERT model to text-to-speech was all running on device using ML. Pretty neat. So now I'd like to talk about some improvements and investments we've been making in the TensorFlow Lite ecosystem focused on improving your model deployment. Let's start with performance. A key goal of TensorFlow Lite is to make your models run as fast as possible across mobile and edge CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, and NPUs. And we've made many investments across all of these fronts. We've made significant CPU improvements. We've added OpenCL support to improve GPU acceleration. And we've updated our support for all of Android Q and an API ops and features. Our previously announced Qualcomm DSP delegate, targeting mid and low tier devices, will be available for use in the coming weeks. And we've also made some improvements in our performance and benchmark tooling to better assist both model and app developers in identifying the optimal deployment configuration. Now, to highlight some of these improvements, let's take a look at our performance just six months ago at Google I.O. using MobileNet for classification inference. And compare that with the performance of today. This represents a massive reduction in latency. And you can expect this across a wide range of models and devices, both low-end and high-end. Just pull the latest version of TensorFlow into your app, and you can see these improvements today. So digging a little bit more into these numbers, floating point CPU execution is our default path, and it represents a, a solid baseline. Enabling quantization, now easier with post-training quantization, provides three times faster inference. And enabling GPU execution provides yet more of a speed up, six times faster than our CPU baseline. And finally, for absolute peak performance, we have the Pixel 4 Neural Core, accessible via the NNAPI TensorFlow Lite delegate. This kind of specialized accelerator, available in more and more of the latest devices, unlocks capabilities and use cases that just a short time ago were thought impossible on mobile devices. But we haven't stopped there. Seamless and more robust model conversion has been a major priority for the team, and we'd like to give an update on a completely new TensorFlow Lite model conversion pipeline. This new converter was built from the ground up to provide more intuitive error messages when conversion fails, add support for control flow, and for more advanced models like BERT, DeepSpeech v2, MaskR CNN, and more. We're excited to announce that the new converter is available in beta and will be available more generally soon. We also want to make it easy for any app developer to use TensorFlow Lite. And to that end, we've released a number of new first-class language bindings, including Swift, Objective-C, C Sharp for Unity, and more. This complements our existing set of bindings in C++, Java, and Python. 
And thanks to community efforts, we've seen the creation of additional bindings in Rust, Go, and even Dart. As an open source project, we welcome and encourage these kinds of contributions. Our model optimization toolkit remains the one-stop shop for compressing and optimizing your model. There will be a talk later today with more details. Check out that talk. So we've come a long way, but we have many planned improvements. Our roadmap includes expanding a set of supported models, further improvements in performance, as well as some more advanced features like on-device personalization and training. Please check out our roadmap on tensorflow.org and give us feedback. Again, we're an open source project, and we want to remain transparent about our priorities and where we're headed. So I want to talk now about our efforts in enabling ML not just on billions of phones, but on the hundreds of billions of embedded devices and microcontrollers that exist and are used in production globally. TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers is that effort. It uses the same model format, the same conversion pipeline, and largely the same kernel library as TensorFlow Lite. So what are these microcontrollers? These are the small, low-power, all-in-one computer computers that power everyday devices all around us, from microwaves and smoke detectors to sensors and toys. They can cost as little as 10 cents each, and with TensorFlow, it's possible to use them for machine learning. ARM, an industry leader in the embedded market, has adopted TensorFlow as their official solution for AI on ARM microcontrollers. And together, we've made optimizations that significantly improve performance on this embedded ARM hardware. We've also partnered, partnered with Arduino and just launched the official Arduino TensorFlow library. This makes it possible for you to get started doing speech detection on Arduino hardware in just under five minutes. And now, we'd like to demonstrate TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers running in production. Today, if a motor breaks down, it can cause expensive downtime and maintenance costs, but using TensorFlow, it's possible to simply and affordably detect these problems before failure, dramatically reducing these costs. Mark Stubbs, co-founder of Shoreline IoT, will now give us a demo of how they're using TensorFlow to address this problem. They've developed a sensor that can be attached to a motor just like a sticker. It uses a low-power, always-on TensorFlow model to detect motor anomalies. And with this model, their device can run for up to five years on a single small battery using just 45 microamps with its Cortex, Ambit Cortex M4 CPU. So here we have a motor that will simulate an anomaly. As the RPMs increase, it will start to vibrate and shake. And the TensorFlow model should detect this as a fault and indicate so with a red LED. All right, Mark, let's start the motor. OK. So here we have a normal state. And you can see this. It's being detected with the green LED. Everything's fine. Let's crank it up. OK, it's starting to vibrate. It's oscillating. I'm getting a little nervous and, frankly, a little sweaty. Red light. Boom. OK, the TensorFlow model detected the anomaly. We could shut it down. Halloween disaster averted. Thank you, Mark. So that's all we have, folks. Please try out TensorFlow Lite if you haven't already. And once again, we are very thankful for the contributions that we get from our community. We also have a longer talk later today. We have a demo booth. Please come by and chat with us. Thank you. My name is Sandeep Gupta. I'm the product manager for TensorFlow.js. And I'm here to talk to you about machine learning and JavaScript. So you might be saying to yourself that I'm not a JavaScript developer. I use Python for machine learning, so why should I care? I'm here to show you that machine learning in JavaScript enables some amazing and useful applications and might be the right solution for your next ML problem. So let's start by taking a look at a few examples. So earlier this year, Google released the first ever AI-inspired Doodle. Uh, what you see on the top left, this was on the occasion of Johann Sebastian Bach's uh, birth anniversary. And users were able to synthesize a Bach-style harmony by running a machine learning model in the browser by just clicking on a few notes. So just in about three days, more than 50 million users created these harmonies, and they saved them and shared them with their friends. Another team in Google has been creating these fun experiences. One of these is called Shadow Art, where users are shown a symbol of a figure, and you use your hand shadow to try to match that figure, and that character comes to life. Other teams are building amazing accessibility applications, making web interfaces more accessible. 
On the bottom left, you see something called creatability, where a person is trying to control a keyboard simply by moving their head. And then on the bottom right is an application called Teachable Machine, which is a fun and interactive way of training and customizing a machine learning model directly in the browser. So all of these awesome applications have been made possible by TensorFlow.js. So TensorFlow.js is our open source library for doing machine learning in JavaScript. You can use it in the browser, or you can use it server-side with Node.js. So why might you consider using TensorFlow.js? Well, there are three ways you would use this. One is you can run any of the pre-existing, pre-trained models and deploy them and run them using TensorFlow.js. You could use one of the models that we have packaged for you, or you can use any of your TensorFlow saved models and deploy them in the web or in other JavaScript platforms. You can retrain these models and customize them on your own data, again using TensorFlow.js. And lastly, if you're a JavaScript developer wanting to write all your machine learning directly in JavaScript, you can use the low-level ops API and from scratch build a new, new model using this library. So let's see why this might be useful. So first, it makes machine learning really, really accessible to a web developer and, Java, and a JavaScript developer. With just a few lines of code, you can bring the power of machine learning in your web application. So let's take a look at this example. Here we have two lines of code with which we are just sourcing our, our uh, library from, from our hosted scripts, and we are loading a pre-trained model. In this case, the body picks model, which is a model that can be used to segment people in videos and images. So just with these two lines, you have the library and the model embedded in your application. Now we choose an image, we create an instance of the model, and then we call the model's estimate person segmentation method, passing it the image. And you get back an array, uh, an object which contains the pixel mask of where there is the person present in this image. And there are other methods that can subdivide this into various body parts, and there are other rendering utilities. So just with about five lines of code, your, your web application has all the power of this uh, powerful machine learning model. So the library can be used both client-side and server-side. Using it client-side in browser has lots of advantages. You get the amazing interactivity and reach of browser as a platform. Uh, your application immediately reaches uh, all your users who have nothing to install on their end. By simply sharing the URL of your application, they are up and running. You get the benefit of interactivity of browser as a platform with ac easy access to webcam and microphone and all other sensors that are attached to the browser. Another really important point is that because these are running client-side, user's data stays client-side. So this has strong implications for privacy-sensitive applications. And lastly, we support GPU acceleration through WebGL, so you get great performance out of the box. Using this server-side, uh, TensorFlow.js supports Node. So lots of enterprises use Node for their backend operations and for a ton of their data processing. Now you can use TensorFlow directly with Node by importing any TensorFlow saved model and running it through TensorFlow.js Node. Node also has an enormous NPM package ecosystem, so you can benefit from that and plug into the, to the NPM repository collection. And for enterprises where your entire backend stack is in Node, you can now bring all of the ML into Node and maintain a single stack. So a natural question to ask is, how fast is it? So we have done some performance benchmarking, and I'm showing here some results from MobileNet inference time. On the left, you see results on mobile devices uh, running client-side. And, uh, uh, and on sort of state-of-the-art uh, uh, mobile phones, you get really good performance with about 20 milliseconds inference time, which means that you can run real-time applications at about 50 frames per second. Android performance has some room for improvement, and our team is heavily focused on, on addressing that. On the server side, because we bind to TensorFlow's native C library, we have performance parity with Python TensorFlow, both on CPU as well as on GPU. So in order to make it easy for you to get started, we have pre-packaged a collection of models, pre-trained models, for most of the common ML tasks. And these include things like image classification, object detection, human pose and gesture detection, speech commands models for recognizing spoken words, and a bunch of text classification models for things like sentiment and toxicity. You can use these models with very easy wrapped high-level APIs from our hosted scripts, or you can NPM install them. 
And then you can use these pre-trained models and build your applications for a variety of use cases. And these include AR, VR type of applications. These include gesture-based interactions that help improve accessibility of your applications, uh, detecting sort of user sentiment and, and moderating content, conversational agents, chatbots, as well as a lot of things around front-end web, web page optimization. So these pre-trained models are a great way to get started, and they're good for many problems. However, often you have the need to customize these models for your own, for your own use. And here again, the power of TensorFlow.js with the interactivity of web comes in handy. And I want to show you this application called the Teachable Machine, uh, which is a really nice way of customizing a model in just a matter of minutes. So I'm going to test both the demo gods as well as the time buzzer gods here and try to show this live. So what you're seeing here is, uh, uh, this is the Teachable Machine web page, which has the MobileNet model already loaded. And we are going to be outputting, uh, we are going to be training three classes. So these are these green, purple, and orange classes. And we will output words. So let's say we will do rock for green, paper for purple, and scissors for red. Okay? So we're going to record some images. So let's record some images for rock. So I'm going to click, click this button here. Rock. And now I'm going to record some images for paper. Rock. And now I'm going to record some images for scissors. Paper. Okay. So there, we have, we have customized our model with these just about 50 images recorded for each class. Let's see how it works. Rock. Paper. Rock. Paper. Rock. Scissors. Paper. Rock. Scissors. So there you go. Uh, so in just a matter of... Pretty neat. So it's really powerful to sort of customize models like these super interactively with your own data. Now, what if you want to train your data on a somewhat of a larger scale? So here, AutoML comes in really handy. AutoML is a GCP cloud-based service which lets you bring your data to the cloud and train a custom, really high-performing model specific to your application. Today, we are really excited to announce that we now support TensorFlow.js for AutoML meaning that you can use AutoML to train your model, and then with one click, you can export a model that's ready to be deployed in your JavaScript application. So using this feature, one of our early testers, the CVP Corporation, which is building some mining safety applications for image classification applications for the mining industry, uh, they were able to use this feature, and in just about five node hours of training, they improved their model accuracy from their manually trained model uh, from 91% to 99% and get a much smaller and faster performing model and then immediately, instantly deploy it in a progressive web application for on-field use. So in addition to models, one of the big focus areas for us has been support for a variety of platforms. And because JavaScript is a versatile language which runs on a large bunch of platforms, TensorFlow.js can be used on all these different platforms. And today, again, we are really happy to announce that we now support integration with React Native. So if you are a React Native developer building cross-platform native applications, you can use TensorFlow.js directly from within React Native, and you get all the power of WebGL acceleration. So we've looked at the capabilities of the library. Let's look at a couple of use cases. Modiface is an AR uh, technology company based out of Canada, and they have used TensorFlow.js to build this, uh, this mobile application that runs on the WeChat mini program environment, where, which, and they did this for L'Oreal, where it lets users try out these beauty products uh, instantly running in these instant messaging applications. And they had some strict criteria about model size and frame rate performance, and they were able to achieve all of those targets with TensorFlow.js running natively deployed on these mobi mobile devices. In order to sort of showcase the limits of what's possible with this, our team has built a fun game and an application to show how you can take a state-of-the-art model, a very high-resolution model that can do face tracking, and we have built this lip-syncing game. So here what you will see is that a user is trying to lip sync to a song, and a machine learning model is trying to identify the lips and trying to match it to how well you are doing uh, lip syncing. And then because it's in JavaScript, it's in the web, we have added some visualization effects uh, and some other sort of AR, VR effects. So let's take a look. Okay, 
It's pretty cool. So this, this demo, the creator of this demo is here with us. He's uh, at the TensorFlow.js demo station. So you know you can uh, please stop by there and you can try your, um, uh, uh, try playing around with this. In the real world, we are beginning to see more and more applications of enterprise using TensorFlow.js in novel ways. Uber is using it for a lot of their internal ML tasks visualization and computations directly in the browser. And a research group in IBM is using it for on the field mobile uh, sort of um, uh, classification of these disease carrying snails which spread certain communicable diseases. So lastly, I want to thank our community. The popularity and growth of this library is in large part due to the amazing community of our users and contributors. And plus, we are really excited to see that a lot of developers are building amazing extensions and libraries on top of TensorFlow.js to extend its functionality. <clears throat> so this was just a quick introduction to TensorFlow.js. I hope I've been able to show you that if you have a web or a node ML use case, TensorFlow.js is the right solution for your needs. Do check out our more detailed talk later this afternoon where our team will dive deeper into the library. And there are some amazing talks from our users showcasing some fantastic applications. TensorFlow.org slash JS is your one source for a lot more information, more examples, getting started content, models, etc. Uh, and so you can get everything you need to get started. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Joseph Paul Cohen, who's from Mila Medical. And he will share with us an amazing use case of how their team is using TensorFlow.js. Thank you very much. Great. I am very excited to be here today. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a chest x-ray radiology tool in the browser. If we look at the classic or traditional uh, diagnostic pipeline, there's a certain area uh, where web-based tools are used by physicians to aid them in a diagnostic decision, uh, such as kidney donor risk or cardiovascular risk. So these tools are already web-based. With the advances of deep learning, uh, we now uh, can do radiology tasks, such as chest x-ray diagnostics, and now put them in the browser. Can you imagine such use cases where this is useful? Uh, in an emergency room where you have a time-limited human, uh, in a rural hospital where radiologists are not available or are very far away, um, the ability for a non-expert to triage cases for an expert, saving time and money. Uh, and where we'd like to go is towards rare diseases, uh, but we're kind of a little data starved in this uh, area to be able to do that. Uh, so this project has been called NICE by Jan LeCun. Uh, so what we need to do to achieve this is run a state-of-the-art chest x-ray diagnostic dense net in a browser. Right? One thing for preserving privacy of the data while well, at the same time of allowing us to scale to millions of users with, with zero computational cost on our side. Right? So how do we achieve this? With TensorFlow.js, which allows us one second feed forward in this dense net model uh, with a 12 second initial load up time. Um, we also need to deal with processing out of distribution samples, uh, where we don't want to process images of cats or, uh, or, or images that are not properly formatted x-rays. Uh, to do this, we're going to use an autoencoder with a SIM score, and we're going to look at the reconstruction. Right? Um, and then finally, uh, we need to compute gradients in the browser right, to show a saliency map of why we made such a prediction. Right? So we could ship two models, with one computing the feed forward and the other one computing the gradient. Or we can use TensorFlow.js to compute the actual gradient graph and then compute it right in the browser, given whatever model we have already shipped. Right? So this makes development really easy, and it's also pretty fast. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tatiana, and I'm going to talk today about MLIR. Before we talk about MLIR, let's start from the basics. We are here because artificial intelligence is experiencing a tremendous growth. All the three components, algorithms, data, compute, have come together to change the world. Compute is really, really important because that's what enables machine learning researchers to build better algorithms, to build new models. And as you can see, the models are becoming much, much more complex. To train a model today, we need several orders of magnitude compute capabilities than we needed several years ago. And how do we build hardware which makes that possible. 
For those of you who versed in hardware details, more lore is ending. This is also the end of the NART scaling. We cannot any more simply to say the next CPU is going to run at higher frequency, and because of that, that will power machine learning. What is happening in the industry is the explosion of custom hardware, and there is a lot of innovation which is driving this compute which makes artificial intelligence possible. So if we look at what is happening, you look in your pocket, you probably have cell phone. Inside that cell phone, most likely there is a little chip which makes artificial intelligence possible. And it's not just one chip, right? There is CPU, there is GPU, there is DSP, there is neural processing unit. All of that is sitting inside a little phone and seamlessly working together to make great user experience possible. In the data center, we see the explosion of specialized hardware also. Uh, Habana, specialized accelerations in CPUs, in GPUs, many different chips. We have TPUs. All of this is powering the tremendous growth of specialized compute in data centers. And once you have more specialized accelerators, that brings more complexity. And as we all know, hardware doesn't work by itself. It is powered by software. And so there is also a tremendous growth in software ecosystems for machine learning. Uh, in addition to TensorFlow, there are many other different frameworks which are trying to solve this problem. And actually, we got a problem with the explosive growth of hardware and software. Yeah. So the big problem here is that none of this scales. Too much hardware, too much complexity, too much software, too many different systems that are not working together. And what's the fundamental problem? The fundamental problem is that we as a technology industry across the board are reinventing the same kinds of tools, the same kinds of technologies, and we're not working together. And this is why you see the consequences of this. You see systems that don't interoperate because they're built by different people and different teams to solve different problems. You know, Vendor X is working on their chip, which makes perfect sense. And it doesn't really integrate with all the different software. And likewise, for the software people that can't know or work with all the hardware people. Um, this is why you see things like you bring up your model, you try to get to work on a new piece of hardware, and it doesn't work right the first time. You see this in the cracks that form between these systems and that manifest as usability problems or performance problems or debugability problems. And as a user, this is not something you should have to deal with. So what do we want? Right? What we'd really love to do is take this big problem, which has many different pieces, and make it simpler by getting people to work together. And so we've thought a lot about this. And the way we, th we think that we can move the world forward is not by saying that there is one right way to do things. I don't think that works in a field that's as growing as explosively as machine learning. Instead, what we think the right way to, get to do this is, is to introduce building blocks. And instead of standardizing the user experience or standardizing the one right way to do machine learning, we think that we as a technology industry can standardize some of the underlying building blocks that go into these tools, that can go into the compiler for a specific chip, that can go into a translator that, that works between one system or the other. And if we build building blocks, we know and we can think about what we want from them. We want, of course, the best-in-class graph technology. Right? That, that's, that's a given. We want the best compiler technology. Compilers are really important. We want to solve not just training, but also inference, mobile, and servers, and including all permutations. So training on the edge, super important, growing, growing, growing in uh, popularity. We don't want this to be a new kind of technology island uh, solution, we want this to be part of a continuous ecosystem that spans the whole problem. And so this is what MLIR is all about. MLIR is a new system that we, we at Google have been building, but we are bringing to the industry to help solve some of these common problems that, that manifest in different ways. And so one of the things that we're really excited about is that MLIR is not just a Google technology, we are collaborating extensively with hardware makers across the industry, and we're seeing a lot of excitement and a lot of adoption by people that are building the world's uh, biggest and most popular hardware across, across the world. But what is MLIR? Well, so MLIR is a compiler infrastructure. Um, 
And if you're not familiar with compilers, what it's really saying is it's saying that it is providing that bottom level technology, low level technology, that underpins building individual tools and individual systems that then get used to help with graphs and help with chips and things like that. And so how does this work? Well, what MLA provides, if you look at it in contrast to other systems, is that it is not, again, a one size fits none kind of a solution is trying to be technology, technology that powers these systems. And so, like we said before, it of course contains the state-of-the-art compiler technology. And we have, uh, both within Google, we have dozens of years of compiler experience within the team, but we probably have hundreds of years of compiler experience across the industry all collaborating together on this common platform. Uh, it is designed to be modular and extensible because requirements continue to change in our field. It's not designed to tell you the right way to do things. As a system integrator, it's designed to provide tools so that you can solve your problems. Now, if you dive into the compiler, there's a whole bunch of different pieces, and so there are things like uh, you know, low-level graph transformation systems. There are things for code generation, so that if you're building a chip, you can handle like picking the right kernel. But the point of this is that MLIR does not force you to use one common pipeline. It turns out that while compilers for code generation are really great, so are handwritten kernels. And if you have handwritten kernels that are tuned and optimized for your application, of course, they should slot into the same framework, should work with existing runtimes, and we really see MLIR as providing useful value that then can be used to solve problems. It is not trying to force everything into one box. So you may be wondering, though, for you, if you're not a compiler person or a system integrator or a chip person, what does this mean to you? And so let's talk about what it means for TensorFlow. Okay. So what it means for TensorFlow is it allows us to build a better system because integrating TensorFlow with the myriad of specialized hardware is really a hard problem. And with MLIR, we can build a unified infrastructure layer, which will make it much simpler for TensorFlow to seamlessly work with any hardware chip which comes out. For you as a Python developer, it simply means better developer experiences. A lot of things that today might be not working as smoothly as we would like them to can be res resolved by MLIR. And so this is just one example. You write a model, you try to run it through the TensorFlow, TensorFlow light converter, you get an error, you have no clue what it is, and now we see issues on GitHub and try to help you. With MLIR, you will get an error message that says, this is the line of Python code which caused that problem. You can look at it and fix the problem yourself. And just to summarize, the reason we are building MLIR is because we want to move faster, and we want the industry to move faster with us. And one of the keys to make industry work well together is neutral governance. And that's why we submitted MLIR as a project to LLVM, and now it is part of LLVM ecosystem. Uh, the code is moving soon. And this is very important because LLVM has a 20-year history of neutral governance and building the infrastructure which is used by everybody in the world. And this is just the beginning. Uh, please stay tuned. We are building a global community around the MLIR. And once we are done, ML will be better for everybody, and we will see much faster advance of artificial intelligence in the world. One more quick. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ankur. Uh, I work at Hike, and I lead the AI innovations over there in various areas, which I'm going to talk today. Uh, formerly, I've been working with IBM Research in New Delhi and also Sun Research Labs here in Menlo Park. So here are some various use cases that we do using AI. The fundamental being Hike as a, you know, a platform for messaging, and now we are driving a new social future. We are looking at a more visual way of expressing you know, interactions between the users. So instead of typing messages and uh, in a laborious way, if one could use and get recommended stickers which could express the same way in a much efficient fashion and a more expressive fashion, then it would be a more interesting and engaging conversation. So the first use case is essentially across multilingual sticker recommendation, where basically we address 
around eight to nine languages currently in India. And as we expand internationally, we will be expressing more number of languages. So we want to go hyper-local and then as well as hyper-personal. From hyper-local perspective, we want to address the needs of a person from his, own, his or her own personal language perspectives. So when you type, you would automatically get speakers recommended in the corresponding native language of the person. The second one is friend recommendation using social network analysis and deep learning, where we use graph embeddings and deep learning to you know, recommend friends. The next one essentially is around fraud analytics. So we have lots of click farms where people try to misuse the rewards that are given on the platform in a B2C setting, and therefore you need interesting deep learning techniques and anomaly detection to address known knowns, known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Another one essentially is around campaign tuning, hyper-personalization, and optimization to be able to address the needs of every user and make the experience engaging and extremely interactive. And finally, we have interesting sticker processing uh, using vision models and graphics, which should be coming soon in our later releases. Going further, you know, we have a strong AI research focus, so we are passionate about research. We have multiple publications in ECIR uh, this year, Ichkai Demo, uh, we have an archive publication, and we have related areas, not directly related to messaging, but we had an uh, ICML workshop paper as well. And fundamentally, we are looking at the kind of problems we address, need to look at you know, extensions or basically address the limitations of supervised learning problems, where we need to address cases where there's a long tail of data, very less kind of labels available, limited number of labels available, very costly to get those labels, and the same problems occur in NLP, vision, uh, you know, reinforcement learning, and stuff like that. So we are looking at meta-learning formulations to address this stuff. We, at Hike, we are looking at 4 billion events per day across millions of users. We collect a terabyte of data, essentially using the Google Cloud, uh, with various tools on Google Cloud, including Kubeflow, uh, BigQuery, Dataproc, Dataflow, and we use it for all the use cases, some of the use cases which I mentioned earlier. So essentially, I will look into one particular use case right now. It is on stickers. So stickers, as I mentioned, are a powerful expressions of you know, emotions, context, and with various kind of visual expressions over there. So the key challenge over there is discovery. If you have tens of thousands of stickers now going into millions and further into billions of stickers, how do you discover these stickers and be able to exchange at real time with few milliseconds of latencies while you are typing of personal interest? So what we want to solve essentially is a chat context with time event of the day, situation, recent messages, gender, language, and we want to predict what's the sticker that's most relevant to it. So building this, essentially, one needs to look at all the different ways a particular text is typed. One needs to aggregate, essentially, the semantically sim similar phrases to have the right encoding across these various languages and also within, between the languages and across the languages so that it does not affect the typing experience and we need to deliver in the limited memory of the device as well as a few milliseconds of response times. So here an overall is a sticker recommendation flow where basically given a chat context and what the user is currently typing, we use a message model which predicts using a classification uh, model. It predicts the message and those messages are mapped to the corresponding stickers. So for prediction, uh, essentially we use uh, a combination of uh, TensorFlow running at the server, TensorFlow Lite running on the device, and in the combination, we want to deliver basically a few milliseconds of latency for getting the accurate stickers recommended. And here we use a combination of neural network and try. Uh, obviously, we quantize the, uh, the neural network on the device using TensorFlow Lite, and we are able to get the desired amount of performance. The stickers essentially come, so once the messages are predicted, the stickers are naturally mapped based on the tags of the stickers on what intent they are meant to deliver, and correspondingly to the message predicted, those stickers are delivered to the user. So this is a complete flow where basically given a chat context, one predicts the message that the person is trying to express. Then one adds the user context from a hyper-personalization perspective, considers sticker preferences, age, gender, and then goes to the relevant stickers. In the stickers, we basically score using reinforcement learning algorithms, MAB to begin with, and more complex going forward, so that the right kind of stickers and the way the people behavior on the platform is changing, the corresponding stickers also adapt to it at real time. Thank you. <laughs>